Hello, everybody. This is Jake Sanzino, host of the Jake and Gino podcast with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, chef, father, six, best-selling author, the G-Daddy. Gino Barber, Gino, how's it going? Jake, it's a great day. You know why it's a great day? Tell me. My daughter, who's a missionary, has been away for three months. She's in Tiger, Georgia right now, and she's coming back today for the holidays, for a couple of weeks. I at least have her, and then she's going to go back. So best Christmas present ever. How you the doing? G-Daddy, the family man. He's made whole. We're making it happen today. <laughs> Tell him we have a great guest. Today's guest is a world-renowned business growth expert. He's a co-founder of The Fielding Group, working with entrepreneurs, business leaders, and investors to improve business performance and build high-value companies. So without further ado, Nick Bradley, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. It is great to be here. Thank you for having me on. It is our pleasure. And for the folks on YouTube, he's got a very sexy pink light in the background, and <sighs> we're enjoying it today. So you got to check that out. But uh, Gino always says I'm a bulldozer, so we're going to massage this a little bit here. So Nick, please share with us your background and tell us how you became a business growth expert. Oh, I don't mind bulldozing. I mean, I, I, my background's Australian, right? So, you know, we're kind of right in there. We don't muck around. So wherever you want to go, guys. We like to jump guys, in, but, you know, we're just yeah. warming up a little bit. I do like the balance, though. You've kind of set it up really nicely. Like, it's kind of like a good cop, bad cop sort of setup. So that's all good. Um, yeah, so, so, so to kick it off, yeah, so I grew up in Australia. I grew up in a place called Adelaide. So if anyone's been to Australia, it's the place that you, you don't tend to go to. It's right down the south, right, right down the bottom of the country. It's a big country. And it's famous for three things. It's famous for lots of churches, like more churches than you can ever imagine. It's famous for big sharks. So like the film Jaws, right? They filmed a lot of open water scenes in South Australian waters. Oh. And then the, yeah, crazy, I know. And, and another story, a segue, I've, I've been out surfing in sharks, infested waters. That's, we'll talk about that later. And the last thing though is um, famous for serial killers. But we have, we have more serial killers or serial killer murders, if you want to call it, per capita than any other um, city in the world. It has there something to do with Jaws being there. It just triggered something in these guys, and it wasn't a good thing. I'm just saying. I, I I, we can imagine why. I'm, I'm talking to you guys now from very close to London, England, and you can imagine why I had to get about as far away as possible from, from little old Adelaide. It might so have been what, safe. <laughs> what made you go from Australia to uh, England? Yeah, so I, I left, I started a business when I was 18. It was a, a personal training business in Adelaide, South Australia. And obviously these days, personal training, like, you know, lots of people have them, it's accessible. Back then in the late 80s, early 90s, personal training was like for doctors, lawyers, you know, stockbrokers, all that sort of thing. So I had that business. It was, I wouldn't say it was massively successful. I, I did manage to exit it uh, and, and sell it and get some cash to move to Sydney. And when I went to Sydney, I, I hooked up with a guy called Matt Hambry, who was best friends with one of the um, people that I was coaching in my personal training business. Now, Matt Hambry was Rupert Murdoch's nephew, and he gave me a shot into the media game, into magazines, newspapers, under the News International Empire. And I managed to work there for a number of years in Sydney. And then mm -hmm. after having some success there, they wanted to bring me out into some of the other provinces. And I ended up here in the UK and I've been here almost 20 years. From that personal training business, what was the next business you started? So this is the thing. So I, I went from starting a business and being more entrepreneurial to then throwing all that away and deciding to be a corporate slave for about 15 years. What made Ooh. you throw it away? What made you throw that away though? You know, there's a couple of different things. Like, you know how when you're growing up, you have different people who who impress and inspire you, usually people in your family, and they have certain values, certain standards that they will try and, I suppose, coach or mentor you on. Mm -hmm. So my grandfather um, back then was, was the guy who was probably the biggest inspiration to me for, for many, many reasons. And he always said to me, listen, get a job, it's safe. And he'd said that for years and years and years. And even though when I was like 18 starting a business, right? I didn't have any fear. There was a bit of like, are you sure that's going to work? Are you sure you want to commit your time to that? Is that going to work for you? Blah, blah, blah. So back to your initial question, the reason I think I left Adelaide to go to Sydney was partly to kind of get out of that environment. Not that they were bad people, they were lovely people, but I needed to change that environment, change my mindset. Mm -hmm. And then I thought I'm going to try and make it in as big a business corporate landscape as I possibly could. I just ended up staying in there a lot longer for reasons we can get into. You got stuck in the swamp, the corporate swamp. I got stuck in the corporate swamp. When was yeah, that I, switch? You're in the corporate swamp. When is it you're saying, <laughs> I got to get back to the entrepreneurial dream? When, when was that moment for you? So to fast forward a bit, because it's an interesting long um, story to some extent. Is I How many years from, in, the, in, in corporate? I'd love to know the time span. Yeah. So I was in corporate for a total of about 15 years. 
And then Great. I went into the world of private equity. And, and that's probably the bit, you know, we were talking before we press record about different TV shows, the world of billions and Bobby Axelrod. I was in that world for about another decade. We went from that. succession to billions, folks, is what we pretty were saying. Much, so, pretty yeah. much. That was great fun. But <laughs> um, yeah, so, but, but private equity is an interesting place because it's kind of not corporate and it's kind of not entrepreneurial, but you're around the environment of high level investment, high value businesses. It's all about scale up to exit pretty much, mm -hmm. right? And it's an interesting world. So I kind of got into that, was pretty successful in that. And from that, I then branched off. I've acquired my own businesses since then. And now I focus on, on focusing on scaling my own businesses to exit. So entrepreneurship, but from a different angle than maybe the startup entrepreneur. So when you look at a business, what are you looking at to value business? What, what excites you about a business? I look at, for me, I look at businesses that are what I call under leveraged. So I'm not the guy who looks at a startup, you know, and sees, you know, something very sexy and exciting that's not profitable, you know, that needs lots of capital and venture capital money to try and, and scale it. That's not me, right? I find it quite um, annoying that people look at a business like a, a WeWork or certainly Uber and they go, oh, wow, it's worth billions. Well, it's, it's not making any money, right? You know, it has the potential to be worth a lot because of the way you're looking at it. But I look at businesses that are, you know, generating profit, uh, are not doing what I call basic fundamentals. They haven't got good processes in them. They haven't lined up their people. The leadership may be lacking. The marketing and sales effort isn't, isn't strong. Customers and cash flow isn't optimized. And I like to go into those businesses and put in those foundations or fix those foundations and then rapidly scale them up so that they can become high value, high cash generating, and, and ultimately businesses that can be sold for life-changing money. Nick, what is the difference between the startup and the scale-up? Let people understand that big difference. Yeah, so startup in many cases, I, I still think it's a rite of passage, right? Just to be super clear, the fact that I did that in the very beginning was an interesting learning period. But if you think about what it feels like, right? At startup, it's, it's usually quite chaotic, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's fun right? It's quite simple. There's a lot of simplicity at the beginning when it's, you know, Larry and Sergey from Google sitting in a shed, you know, coding, right? But as you start to move in, there's certain parameters and certain sort of things that happen. As you start to move into employing more people, and that magic number is normally somewhere between 15 to 20. As soon as you start bringing more complexity in, you have to start bringing in layers of management. You have to bring processes and systems in. And as soon as you start doing that, that's when you start to move into more of a scale-up phase of a business. Okay. Mm, yes. Now, what a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with is that's not a lot of fun. Oh, it's process, uh, right? And that's where you see a lot of these businesses hiring in other CEOs and whatever else when they get to a certain level because it's a different skill set and mindset to take that business up. But the way I look at it like this, just to summarize, you know, the answer is a business that's generating predictable revenue, predictable flow of the right customers, core processes that are driving a well-oiled machine is something that defines a business that's in the scale-up stage. And it's also defines a business which is highly valuable because if I'm going to go buy a business, you know, ultimately the more that it is set up and running well, the higher the value is for me because I don't have to go in there and fix it. Mm -hmm. And when you're looking at, at a business and you're looking at its leaders, what are you looking for in, in its leadership? Yeah, so I'm looking for a balance of different skill sets across. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you go back to some of the stuff that Gino Wickman talks around his amazing books, um, Traction and Rocket Fuel, he talks about visionary and integrators, right? Mm -hmm. So you need someone in the business, usually the founder or, you know, the, the co-founders, if it's that, who are looking at what we call the strategic tempo. So they need to be sitting at that 30,000 foot view and be looking at the market, looking at kind of what's happening and making decisions based on that. Normally, those people are not good at running the business. They're not the best leaders. Best way to think of it is like, if you want to use a, a sort of military um, analogy, you've got the lieutenants or the captains, and then you've got the, the staff sergeants that are running the people on the, in the platoon. You know, you want people in the business who are great at running teams, processes, and people. So integrators, as Gina would call it. And you want people who are more visionary and strategic, and that's the balance. Mm -hmm. Usually, it's hard for someone to be able to do both of those things well, particularly like a Ray scale. Dalio or a Steve Jobs. Is I forget in Dalio's book he talked about it, but there's a few unicorns out there, and he labeled them a personality trait. He sort of lumped himself in with Steve Jobs that that are the integrator <laughs> and the visionary. Do you, you recall that or no? Yeah, I do. I know yeah. I've read I've read his book as well. Forget yeah, I forget I, the I forget the branding he put around it, but that was like his uh you know his way to. You know, I mean, it of, does happen. It, it definitely yeah. does happen. Yeah. But you, what what you forget, and this is I learned this when I, I spent um a few years in a business called Getty Images, which was a business that was basically built yeah, on acquisitions. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, yeah, and um 
and you know, you look at the, 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 the co-founders and you'll say, oh, they're both visionaries. But if you look at the people that were running the business, they had a team of integrators underneath them. Yeah. So, so Steve Jobs and the Dell, they, they've got these people. They just, they have the ability to be able to be expansive in their thinking, strategic, but also granular when it matters. And that's the yeah. difference between those people. Let's pull this into the multifamily, Jake. If, Gino, in. if Jake and Gino have 75 units and we're sitting there, we're going, it's time to scale. We're just the mom and pops here. We're burned out. What's the next step that we need to do to scale our operations? Let me, let me ask you three questions, Absolutely. right? And these are, these, are, these are three important questions. This is a proven actually... process right here, Gina. I'm, I'm ready for this. I'm ready to well, go. I, well, <laughs> this, this is more, this is going to get you thinking, guys. Here we go, right? First and foremost, right? You're saying, you know, you're getting potentially burnt out. You want to, you want to scale, you know, exit, whatever. What is your individual life-changing number, guys? What's the number? Not the number that's a billion or 500 million or whatever it is. What's the number that changes your world? It gives you both back time and money freedom. You have to say it, but that's the question. No, say what it, Gino. He ain't afraid. I've yeah, surpassed, go for it. I've, I've Step up to the plate. I've, I've surpassed the number, so it's it's irrelevant to me. So he wants twenty Gs a month. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, twenty Gs a month can get him in a a stable position. Five years. Ago, okay, so if I, if I said yes. if I said look in your bank accounts now, right? So we're getting things like what would be the number that you'd want to see there? Let's, uh, not that you want to keep it in your bank accounts. I get that, but let's just let's just play this game. What's the number you'd want to see in your bank account for you to go? That's it. I'm done financially. Fifty I've million. Okay, good. Do you know? Never really thought about that, Nick, to be honest with you, because I don't, I don't <laughs> want to be done. Yeah, that's, that's, this is why I'm asking the question. I, 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 uh, <laughs> I don't want to be done. That's the problem. I don't want to see that number because I want to continue to work because I love what I'm doing. So, okay, let's say in the bank, 20 million, let's just say. Okay. okay. The, average, the average answer is about 20 million, okay? Not to say you're average, you know, because I can tell you're not, but that's the average answer, right? Mm -hmm. The second question is, and this is where you were starting to go, is why does that bloody matter, right? Whether it's 50 million or 20 million, why does it matter, mm -hmm. right? What's it going to give you? You know, what, how does it create, you know, a legacy yes. generational wealth, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the third question, which is, which is kind of where we we're going with your initial question is, is what you're doing now, both in your business and your life going to get you to that outcome? Gotcha. Okay. Now, normally, and I, 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 they're, 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 they're kind of high level questions, right? But normally, if you go and speak to a business owner who's got a business that's generating, let's say, seven figures, low to mid seven figures, and you, and you have that conversation with them. Normally, they've never thought about those questions. And then you say, well, why are you doing what you're doing? So if you haven't got the end game, if you don't know what the end result is that you're working for and you're building back from that, which is what we do in private equity, right? Then what are you building towards? Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. It's in, and it comes back to, I've said this in so many podcasts, Stephen Covey's start with the end in mind. It's really weird how you really have to do that. And it takes a lot of work and it's reverse engineering. What do you want to see at your funeral? What does it look like? And I guess reverse engineering it, putting in your values, your identity, your beliefs is all going to go into that. And they're tough questions, but is it what you're doing now? I, I think for me, I, we are. We're, we're buying deals. We're growing our businesses. We're enjoying it. So that, that 75 unit person, he's answered these questions. What's the next step for him as far as systems? Hold on. Can I bulldoze for a minute? You, oh, please no, do. It's, it's, it's actually snowplow, not bulldoze. It's snowplow, snowplow. Cause I'm from yes. New York. I got it. Thanks ready for it. Go for it. <laughs> Whatever. So here's, here's just my take on it all. Cause I've, I've pondered this stuff and it may be just weird, but I'm very happy to be in the multifamily apartment space. So we buy multifamily build, buildings, yep. right? And for myself, we've been financially free for a long time and I enjoy the game. I would be extremely bored if I was not doing this. Uh, it gives me fulfillment in life. I enjoy it. I love the acquisition. I love the hunt, et cetera. It's sustainable. It builds generational wealth. It keeps me in a phenomenal tax situation because of depreciation. So my ultimate goal is to continue just to accumulate this cash flow snowball and grow that. Meanwhile, bringing in more acquisitions because that helps from a tax perspective and the party keeps going. I have a you know fairly well systematized business where we have great people working alongside us to grow it and, and keep the thing going. And every day we're looking at it from a standpoint, you use the term well-oiled machine. We love to use that term within the business. So that if, you know, for whatever reason, we don't, we're not even looking to sell, but we want to build a business that's a well-oiled machine. So if we were to sell it, it's ready to go like tomorrow. You know, and Perfect. we set it up mentally like that. But we don't yep. want to sell. We want to just continue to grow it. And then, you know, I'd love for, you know, to, you know, say, hey, you know, family you know, whatever, and, and my life, enjoy this, figure it out, peace, I'm out of here, or whatever the hell the case may be, right? But that's, that's it. Like, and, and, and I just want to grow the cash flow snowball, keep the thing going. What the hell are you supposed to do with your, like, 
the thing when you're saying about like building saleable business, it's like it's hard enough to get these damn deals, then build it up and then to sell the fucking thing like that. That like that seems like too much damn work where if you're just building a sustainable machine over time. And I think that's the difference between the private equity and the long term like business growth mindset. So I'd love to just hear your perspective on that. And I'm not saying either one is right or wrong. It's personal no, preference. It, it right? is personal preference. I mean, and, and of course you're talking to the guy that's focused on excess. So I'm going to have a, a yeah. polarizing view on this. And, well, you know, we I need it. Say, we need it. So people have like, you know, can see both sides of the spectrum. Right. And, and, and listen, remember, you know, to go back to what Gino said beforehand, when you, when you create something, you know, really extraordinary and you sell it, you know, for life-changing money or, or for whatever you define that is, it doesn't mean you stop. Right. You know, if yes. you then chose to go and, you know, sit on a beach or buy an island, right, then that's your choice. What most people do that I've sort of been exposed to, certainly in the kind of higher level exits. So, you know, I've been involved in three 10 figure exits, that's three exits over a billion dollars. You know, they go off and become more philanthropic, right? They go off and try and think more about impact and contribution. They think about how they can make a bigger difference, right? They also um, go off and build a bigger empire. So if the game is no longer money, the game might be what you think you are capable of. Could also be status, right? You know, people don't like to admit that, but that still can be a massive driver, right? So yeah, it's not like, like because it you're doing the philanthropy thing, like the world's viewing you as a better human and it makes you feel good yeah. about yourself, right? And people yeah. don't talk about this shit, but you know what? No, but let's be fucking real with it. Like that's a huge thing. Like you're, you're stroking your ego. Look at me, I did so well. And now I take care of the world, baby. Like, you know, let's yeah, be honest. Yeah, it's with like, it, right? you know, it's like, it's like, it's the golf club conversation. Yeah. Oh, so, you know, so Jake, you sold your business for like a lot of money. Yeah, sold the business. Yeah, you know what? And then, then all of a sudden, you're turning up in the Aston Martin or the Ferrari, whatever it is, right? But the point is, not everyone's like that. But it's not the it's not the end. The exit isn't the end. The exit can often be the beginning. Okay. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing I will say to you, and this is why I'm so parochial about this. And I often say, and I'm quoted in saying that you don't make serious money running your business. You make serious money selling one. Okay. And that's where you can get the compound effect of of all the time you've put into it. So the last big exit I was involved in was a, um, a private equity exit. We sold the business for $2.3 billion in 2017. And that was a 14 times multiple on the profit of that business. For everyone listening to this, what does that mean? Well, that means take one year of profit in your business, right? Times that by 14, 14 years and get that in one lump sum. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you've got all the crazy tax things you can do. And you get cut down on it. So it's like, yeah, but fair enough. Yeah. Depends, right. where, you, depends yeah. where you're offshore yeah. all your money, but that's, yeah. that's a different podcast. <laughs> right. But, but anyway, but you know, and, and so the reason I, the reason I say this and, and I, and I, and I'm hundred percent on the fact that you don't have to sell it, but you need to build it to sell. Right? I agree exactly with that. hundred percent. Yes. Because let me tell you the horror story. Just one of many. So in, in, I've been involved in 117 acquisitions and 25 exits, right? Over my sort of 10 year private equity career. There was one that really kind of grates me still. And this was um, a young guy, sort of late, late thirties, and he'd built up an energy business and he was essentially selling wholesale energy, which you can do here in the UK. He'd been doing that for just under 10 years and he had positioned the business for exit. He was going to sell it. Then he thought he'd hold on just to get a little bit more money. Right now, his exit was going to be 58 million pounds. Right. He'd already got it lined up. It was going to get consolidated into another big energy group. Anyway, long story short, tariff reg, uh, legislation changed and the EBITDA of that business went from 8 million um, per year to 800,000 pounds. Right. Then he got fined 14 million pounds because he was, there was an issue with the way that the um, tariffs were then um, changed. He ended up selling that business for 150,000 pounds, right? just the assets. Uh, when a year beforehand, he was sitting on, as I said, around 50 or 60 million. Now, you could stings. argue, it does sting. And, and my thing is, like, so you, you use the word sustainability, right, beforehand, right? Mm -hmm. and, and my view is you can do a lot. As a great leader and business owner, you can do a lot to try and keep something sustainable. But everything has a cycle. Right, whether we like it or not. And the problem is at the moment, those cycles, because of digital change, massive things going on. Dude, globally. I was just reading about Sears this morning. You want to talk about the fall of an empire, late 1800s. And then they had this massive, you know, around, uh, I think it was 1995, bought that massive, uh, mm -hmm. you know, corporate park outside of Chicago. Uh, and now there's 300 stores, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Over, and they had like 3,000 that. So sad. So sad. And they they, they really, combined and I, and Kmart I quite, and Land's End, like dumb shit towards the end. Like, what I get are you quite emotional doing? about it because, again, my, my thinking, right, is this, and this is just the personal thing, was once, once people achieve some level of financial and time freedom, okay, which is a goal for a lot of people in their yep. lives, 
then most of them go off to do other really incredible things, right? So, so my view is if I can help um, entrepreneurs and business founders achieve that, then that's where I push people towards. If you can build something to sell it, damn we'll sell it. If it gets you your life-changing number, like we spoke about, damn we'll do it. It doesn't mean it's the end for you. And you don't have the risk of all these other things that are out of your control, not because you were bad at running a business, just simply you're at the wrong time, wrong place, and maybe you weren't externally focused enough. And that's, that's kind of where I, as I said, I'm quite bleh, on this because I'm passionate about, you know, what I've seen happen and what I see can happen. So Jake, since you were reading the Sears story, why do you think they failed? What was the key element of, of, of them failing? Evolution. They you know, the, the world evolved. No, the world evolved and, and they didn't stay relevant. And they made, towards the end, they made some bad business moves in terms of lands. And they sold Craftsman, which is probably the only damn good thing that they had. And, uh, and then they, uh, they bought Kmart. So, you know, just because something's cheap or, you know, whatever you can get it for a price, you know, and it was, it was like grasping for straws or air or whatever the hell you want to say towards the end to try to, you know, remain relevant. But it was just, it was, it was poor decisions towards the end and a a declining or, you know, eroding business model, if you want to say as retail. Would you say though, it was a slow train wreck because it didn't happen in a year or two. This was like decades. Well, I mean, if you look at, look at the whole time though, you're talking 130 years, right? But the last 20 years was an absolute. So you know, it was was five years. I would say that just, it went, you know, you have 130 years and five years changed the game with e-commerce. But you're talking five, but I'm talking, let's go back. Like the the whole process It's not just the five years. Kmart, Land's End and e-commerce all within like a five to 10 year period. Wow. That's kind of fast when you look. I mean, that's less than, that's like less than 10% of yeah, the percentage of the, the time. Of, exactly. I mean, I, I lost a bit of money um, back in 2018, 2019, because I was investing in car parks and car parks because people in the UK commute into, into London or some of the bigger cities here. And so, so I said, I live two hours North, but I can actually get on a fast train and be into London in 50 minutes. Right. Mm-hmm. So of course, no one expected people not to be going into large cities for work pre COVID. Right. Yes. So car parks were flying people investing it. Now you go into any of these like car parks near local train stations and they're damn empty because everyone's working from home off zoom. Mm-hmm. And so what is the car park? Thing, Are you talking like a parking lot? Yeah. Parking lot. Different gotcha. term just here. making sure but, yeah. never heard it. No, but yeah. that sort of thing. Like yeah. it's, it's just changed, right? Because there was a big thing happened. No one predicted a pandemic, right? Or maybe some people did. Mm-hmm. And it just changed <laughs> the way that we work. Yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden, like, you know, if you've got an empire of, you know, parking lots or private equity back, all of a sudden the value of that, that model, has changed. And that's just obviously yeah. one example. Before we go to the short answers, I like this question here, the growth precision. What's the five key areas that a business must master to really scale? Yeah. So, so I look at it from to start, you said in the very beginning, you've got to start with the end in mind. So the first part is being really, really clear on, on purpose, purpose and direction. Okay. So for me, it's understand what business you're building, why it matters and where you're heading towards. It's the whole mm-hmm. saying of, you know, if you're going to fly somewhere in a plane, you know, you better have a destination. Otherwise you're going to end up somewhere. It may not be where you want to go. And you'd be surprised, even decent businesses, when you go in there and say, okay, so where are we going here? Right. What's the North star? People can't answer that. I would say 60 to 75% just throwing it out there. They can't answer that. I couldn't answer my first very business. Even when I started Jake and Gino, now I have a clearer vision. That was only a few years ago. So that's a really challenging question everybody out there if you're at 75 units what's your end in mind what are you looking to do with this business take a yes. step back right now pause the recording and reflect on that for a couple of minutes because it's a challenging question and i think the rest of what nick's going to be discussing will make much more sense to you so start with the end in mind where do you want to end up ultimately precisely and, and, and clarity as an entrepreneur more so than anything when you have clarity you're going to be able to sprint you're going to be able to you know, focus on what's important and moving the business. I just think clarity is so tremendously important because so much when you're, when you're growing a business, especially a startup, you don't know what you're getting into. And it's the uncertainty that'll eat you alive. So the more clarity you can get, the better off you're going to be. And multifamily, I don't want to say it's simple, but it's not rocket science. So if you put in the work, you're going to get there faster. Exactly. The second one is, is, is obviously the product that you have, right? And product, I mean, in the generic term, but what are you focused on? So, you know, what exactly, what's the service that you're providing? What's the value that you're value. providing? Mm-hmm. And when I go into businesses that are starting to slow down or growth has stopped, normally they've tried to go too wide. They're trying to serve too many people. They're not clear enough on those, yeah. on those areas. And the way to kind of get growth again is to go narrow precisely. Yeah. So that's the second thing again with, you know, not rocket science, this stuff, but a lot of people forget it. Third one is, is what I call predictability. Predictability in terms of your sales and marketing effort. So if you haven't got a predictable engine, predictable process around how you are driving sales, Mm -hmm. so leads to conversion, whatever that is, 
and you've got that as automated as possible, right? And, and to some extent disciplined with a rhythm, then again, that's an area that can really bring you down. That's a hard one, everybody. That, that's what we're figuring out with Jake and Gino. So that is something that you need to work on. And that's where you need skill sets there. If, you, if you're an entrepreneur and that's not your skill set, don't worry about it. You suck at it, find somebody who's good at it because that will put the fuel, the gasoline on the fire that will take your business from two to 5 million in one year and from five to 10 million in the next year. If you can nail this number three, Nick. Yeah, absolutely. And then you go into the fourth one, which is effectively people and process together. Because some people ask me, which comes first? Do you have to hire the right people, then create the process? You know what? It does depend a little bit. I tend to, this is how I do it. I tend to work on what the process is needed first and then find the best people to drive that. So it is a bit of a, a piece. The way I try and describe this is in your senior team and leaders, you need to have great people around you, right? Who can then build out certain things. But when you get into the engine room where things have to happen in a methodical, very, very clear expectation, that's when you can get more um, driven in, on the process being the most important thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the question we said at the very beginning, what's the definition of scale up? Well, ultimately it comes down to two really important characteristics, great people, right processes. And that really defines how you can grow quickly. And then the last throw a little, one, throw a little culture in there too, right? Sprinkle a little culture. Yeah, in there. Yeah. I do normally talk about culture a little bit, of course, but yeah, I was a turnaround guy for years. I just went in there and have you ever seen True up culture? In the air? Let's blow and go, baby. Come on. <laughs> have you seen up in the air with George Clooney? Right. He's no. cultures we make. Oh, yes, they did. Yes. We yeah, make great. money. That's the culture. Get the hell out of the way. <laughs> it was a bit like that. I, I, I'm a little bit more balanced now. I'd like to think, but yeah. But thank you for thank you for that. <laughs> the last one, the last one is is what I call under the characteristic of just performance. Performance meaning this that you have to be focused on profit. Like I said before, businesses that are just going after revenue on the hope that one day it's going to be profitable, I'm just not into that, right? I understand the reasons why, but for me, you know, a business that drives cash flow is, is a more valuable, more important business. And then the other piece is they're making sure that you're measuring everything across that whole chain, right? Metrics and data, not overanalyzing, but understanding that, you, that the cause and effect of the various things that are going on, which is driving the value, which is driving the profit, which is going to get you to something which is ultimately going to get you that freedom we spoke about. All right, guys, let's take a quick time out to hear from our sponsor. Are you looking for ways to improve your life? Here at Jake and Gino, our mission is to empower students through financial education and the vehicle of multifamily investing. Yes, Jake. We agree that a person with financial intelligence can change the world for the better. We've created our proprietary three-step framework, buy right, manage right, and finance right, that we teach to our community. This framework, along with education, our one-on-one -on -one mentorship, on-site boot camps, and the amazing community has propelled our students to massive success. We've all been there. We've had so many students that have been able to shift their mindset, overcome limiting beliefs, and set a clear path to achieve their goals. Whether you're currently fixing and flipping, wholesaling, or buying single-family rentals, and you know that multifamily investing is the right vehicle for you, I encourage you to visit jakeandgino.com forward slash apply to schedule your complimentary consultation with our team. And I want to let you know this isn't a high pressure sales call. It's really just a discovery call to get to know each other better and see if we're a good fit for working together. And if for any reason we're not a good fit, our team has tons of resources we will share with you to help you along your journey. If you're ready to stop spinning your wheels, go to Jake and gino.com forward slash apply and schedule your call now. All right, we're back. So we're breaking down scaling a business right now. And what was the first one? I, ha I have you basically narrowed down to a niche for the second one. Three was marketing, four people process, five performance and measure. What, what was the first one? It's purpose and vision. So purpose it's understanding vision. where you're going and it's understanding why, the why behind that. Okay, so you, you roll in to this uh, you know, multifamily group. They have yep. a couple thousand units, but they're, they're, they're growing really quick, but they're floundering. And so you're going to take this, you have sort of, you know, these are the five areas that you kind of look at to, to start to poke holes in a, in a business. And then you start to correct these. Is that fair to say? Is that typically yeah, how you so work? I do an assessment on it um, that's, under a yeah, framework. Let's hear about it. Yeah. It's called a predictable growth framework, yeah. right? So if you're trying to, you're trying to, ultimately people are trying to grow their businesses, right? In whatever yeah. way that's defined. And there are going to be things that are hampering that growth, right? So I like to diagnose where the issue is. It's, it's usually, if you take those five things, there's usually three of them, let's say, right? That are really good, right? Because yeah. if you've got a business that's of a certain size, you're doing something right. Let's be yes. frank. 
but there's usually a couple of things that aren't working or aren't optimized or think of it like a, a pipe that's got a blockage in it, right? So I'm looking like almost like a doctor. I'm looking to try and find, you know, the, the, the symptom, which I can then get into the cause and I can fix it. And usually it's quite a granular piece. It's normally like, well, you know, you, you haven't got predictability of leads. Why haven't you got predictability of leads? Oh, well, you haven't got a process and you're not measuring it. Okay. Mm -hmm. What is the process? I can't define it. But that first one we spoke about, about purpose and vision. Normally you start a business at the beginning and you have a very clear view of like, well, I want to, I want to build something. I want to create something. When the complexity comes in, sometimes as an entrepreneur or a founder, you get clouded and you may have growth back to your example, the, uh, you know, multifamily but you may not then know what the next step is, right? The next piece. So what I say is instead of trying to go too far out, bring it back to the next 90 days, work on a 90 day cadence, work on what you're trying to affect in the next 90 days, which is working towards obviously something that you can create in the future, which is the vision. I love this stuff so much. I really do. Like I'm, I'm so delighted to have you on here. So what we see in our space many times is that if you have someone that's been able to acquire some units, okay, the purpose and vision may be lacking because they, they kind of got into it. They wanted to create revenue and, and whatnot. So that may be wobbly at best. Yep. The niche is probably there. They're buying multifamily apartments. They're kind of scaling that out. That's probably there. The marketing's probably there. High demand right now for multifamily, typically not an issue. If they're self-managing, meaning that they're, they're not third-party in the property manage it, management, the people in process could be a huge issue, huge yes. hole. So, so one and four, and then, and then that people in process probably rolls in through the management with number five, where they're not clear on their KPIs and what they should be measuring to hold people accountable. So two, three, probably there, I could see one, four and five. So the folks out there, if, if you know, you're growing your business and things, these are the, the holes that may be in your boat right now um, that, that could be remedied. And you know, I think that we've done scaling up, we've done traction and things like that. You need to basically get with a group that focuses on, you know, this stuff that can help scale your business or you're going to remain floundering. That was the difference between us creating a well-oiled machine in, in our in our group versus, you know, people going, what the hell, our hair is on fire and, and not enjoying life, right? I mean, that's, you probably have some experiences of, of rolling into places where it's like, oh my God, this is chaos, yeah? More often than not, so the person the person who yeah. calls me up is is stuck, uh, overwhelmed, burnt out, stressed, has run out of ideas. Yeah. Right. And that, that, now the interesting thing, right? And this is this is the bit that I and find it's not the ideas. <laughs> no, no, it's well. Here's here's the thing, right? A lot of them are trying to hide that as well because the people who come into my world have had success. Let's be super clear, we're not at the startup phase. They've already yeah. built something that's valuable. Yeah. The business though currently may be not as not meeting their expectations. So they, they want it to be growing faster or they want it to be more value. They want to be making more money, whatever that is, right? Remember, expectations versus your reality is where people get you know, most of their problems from, right? It's not what mm -hmm. I, I want it to be this and it's not. But they don't admit it to many other people, right? So, so they'll be trying to be the best leader they can for their teams, best you know, partner, dad at home, whatever, okay? And then they show up and I have a conversation with them and they kind of go, oh, finally, I can talk to someone about this stuff, Right. And that, that to me is quite an important point to what you were just saying. Your wife is, may not be able to relate or your, your husband may not be able to relate, right? Yeah. And also back to ego, you know, again, if you've had some success, you don't want to be the person who's not succeeding, right? Or showing signs of that, but that then creates more stress. Yeah. So, so quite often, like, you know, getting into groups, right? With people who are going through the same journey so you can get different perspectives, but also share that journey coaching, mentoring, all that sort of stuff, like huge game changing thing. If you want to kind of get to where you want to get to faster and, and enjoy it to your point. Yeah. There's, there is a better place if you're out there suffering right now as a, as a business leader, cause you know, we've been there and, uh, and it's real. So um, any books that you'd like to recommend to the folks out there that have uh, had a positive impact on your life? Yeah, we, I mean, because we talked about it and we talked about it a few times. I mean, yeah. the I, I've used um, traction as a as yeah. a basis of a model, not not the full EOS thing, but I've used some yeah. of the basis of traction. Oh, great stuff it, in there. Yeah, I give it to people who are sort of high six, uh, sort of low to mid seven figure businesses who want to get to eight figures, right? Whatever the business model, it doesn't matter, right? Because it's the principles of business and leadership that are in that's in Gino's work. So I love that. I forget his name, but the twelve week year. Is a fantastic book as well. I have to put that in the show notes. But that's again, how do you bring forward this idea that a year feels like a long way away or three years feels like a lifetime? How do you bring everything into something that's focused on 12 weeks or 90 days? 
Yes, so your quarterly really priorities. Powerful. Yes. Yeah, yes. and doing it like that. But again, just getting really precise. Like, you know, one of the habits I've done for years is I plan out my week on Sundays and I make sure that I don't go to bed the night before without having my top three to five priorities for the next day written down. Ah, uh-huh, good. Right, you got it. So <laughs> Sundays, like man, that. is a magical day. You got to put that hour or two in every Sunday. I'm telling you, game changer. Yes, yes. And then the last, the last kind of book is um, if you're interested in exiting a business, right? There's the um, the private equity playbook. I think it's by someone Coffee. I'll find out. Is that the way. name of it? Yeah, and it talks oh, nice. about how it talks it talks to how how you can exit a business and what you need to be thinking about if you want to play in that space. So if anyone's listening to this and they're thinking, you know what? I, I wouldn't mind building something and scaling it through acquisitions and, and then looking to exit at some point. That's not a bad way of looking at the environment that you'd be going into. Mm-hmm. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your community and what you're excited about right now. Any projects that you're working on, et cetera. Yeah, cool. So yeah, my community, my Facebook community is called build your business empire. So I think, you know, again, we've talked about the reasons behind why it's called that. Cause it's not just about selling your business and then stopping. It's about what do you do after that? So that's a great community of people who are, you know, what I call highly ambitious entrepreneurs and business founders. And so we, you know, provide a lot of different content into that. Um, I've just recently rebranded my podcast. So my podcast was called scale up your business. Um, it was number one UK, number one business podcast in the UK for a number of weeks. And now we've called it scale up with Nick Bradley. Cause I've got a broader range of people coming on. Great to get you guys on at some point as well. We can talk about all your crazy antics in the world of multi. There's a lot of crazy family in there. And I like the banter. This has been fun. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, for, for me, my business is, is based uh, currently in the UK, but we're about to incorporate in the US because we've got lots of people in the US who are interested in the stuff that we're doing, particularly that pathway to exit. So for me, it's about how we roll that out next year and, uh, and do more stuff in, uh, in the US from that. You know, it's that time again. What say you? What say you, Gandalf? Mr. Stenziano, you give me a minute or two on this one? This Take one, your time. This, it's this, your this show. One, this you, one's gonna be a little, it's going to be a little bit fun because it's very eerily similar to Jake. Because I can see Nick and Jake on a Sunday working on their working on their weekly chores, writing it down. Young Nick Bradley in Australia, <laughs> pumping it up, personal trainer, and him yelling at his, 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 his students, get your ass. Because I can see Jake at the same time. He loved personal, physical, personal training. I was a personal trainer back in the day. He just, ah. it just sucked the life out of him, right? And while Nick is Hated doing it. that, <laughs> <laughs> Nick is out there swimming with the sharks. He's trying to dodge some serial killers. He's like, what the hell am I doing in, in Australia? I got to get out of here. I just met Rupert. I got a connection to Rupert Murdoch. I'm going on. I'm going back to the UK. Let me go find out my new dream. But you know what? I'm going to quit this entrepreneurial crap because it ain't for me right now because grandpa says, get a job, play it safe. And we all listen to grandpa because I love my grandpa. Who doesn't love their grandpa? Come on. Everybody loves to grandpa. grandpa. But then 15 years into it, you're like, hold on a second. This is not where I, this is just another suck. This feels like personal training right now. I shouldn't be doing this. My sole purpose is to be an entrepreneur, to get out there and to help people scale their businesses, get into private equity, which is like a sort of a mix sort of a hybrid. You're not really an entrepreneur, but you're not really corporate. And that's where the fun is. You start learning those skill sets. You start building a brand, building a business. And you say to yourself, what I love about it, Jake, more than anything is that, that exit model where 14 years, you can get it all in one year. And I really need to recap these five for everybody. So I want you to take a- You know, just said, take the money and run. Well, Jake, I mean, if you really think about it logically, if you take the money, I don't want you to run. I want you to run to another endeavor. Forget about the beach. The beach is not for us. The, it's not for, the retirement <laughs> model is for people who are working for government or for they, they just they, they want you're, you're going to get a fat belly if you do that. Yeah, yeah okay. you want to. So listen, number five, there's five of them here. The end in mind. Everyone write that down. What is your purpose? What is your vision? The second one is what is your product? What value are you delivering? We're delivering clean, safe, affordable housing. Number three, predictability. Where's your lead gen? How are you getting leads and how are you converting those leads? The fourth one, processes, people, people, processes, whichever one you want to put in. That's it. People, systems, and culture. The three of them. And number five is the performance and the measure. Because if you can't measure it, then you can't manage it. It's all Hmm. about KPIs and key performance indicators. Focus on profit. But ultimately for me, profit is the fuel. It's not the destination. And I think everyone listening to this is we want to use the profit to continue to grow our businesses. And if you're going to exit it, it's all about what the cash flow is and what about the profitability is. So that's what I got, Broseph. Here's the thing. Damn, that was a good summary. No, that was a that was a performance. (laughs) And one of two things happened. Gina was either with his opera coach last night or Julia, his wife, gave him a double espresso before the show. 
Tell us the truth. Which is it? Bro, I can rip one out right now. I was I was, oh. a, little, I was doing a little opera last <laughs> night. So uh, you know what it, it is, the Jake? Opera. I, I'm going to be honest with you. This is stuff that I wish we had known 10 or 15 years ago. And I'm going to be completely honest with everybody. I had a restaurant for 20 years. If I knew this shit 20 years ago, I would be freaking Olive Garden because this is so vital. It's not about sitting in the kitchen and washing dishes. It's about getting somebody to do that for you. And this is what we didn't mention. You are the person when you started as an entrepreneur, you need to grow out of that person because Jake and Gina were cutting grass. We we're doing the bookkeeping and that's okay, but that's not where the value is. Ultimately, you need to transform yourself into what Nick is talking about. And that's hard. That's shedding your identity and creating another identity. And at Jake and Gino, we create multifamily entrepreneurs. That's our vision statement. That's what it's all about. It's not just about acquiring assets and building a portfolio. It's about becoming an entrepreneur. It's about legacy skills that you learn that you can actually teach to your kids. You don't want to transfer wealth to your children. You want to transfer those skills that you've learned. And how do you do that? By becoming an entrepreneur and by creating impact. What all say right. you, Stenzi? It would not have been Olive Garden, Okay. Just you would have been like, you would have been like for the families out there, you would have been like Gusto in Ratatouille. Okay. You nice big bowl of pasta up there with a smile and a fork and a spoon, man. That's going to be you. That could have been you. Anyways, you're in a lot better place right now. Yeah. I just want to say, Nick, this was a lot of fun, man. Appreciate you coming on. I love the pink light for the folks out there. Get on YouTube. It's sexy as hell. You're making it happen, big man. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Nick. Hey, it's been great. I, I want to try some of that pasta. I've got to say, Gino, that sounds damn good. <laughs> Dude, I'm on quinoa now. I can't have pasta anymore. Is he going to like, watch it? Yes. Go, go, Plant-based quinoa. There we go. But now, listen, guys, awesome conversation. Thank you so much for having me on the show today. Take care, everybody. Take care. Thanks. See you guys.